Uh, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in Acts 16 in just a moment. Actually, we'll be in John chapter 6 first. I appreciate Thomas leading the songs that he led this morning, and especially the one right before the lesson, because in this lesson or this song, as we sing, hopefully in spirit and in truth, we're making a great statement of affirmation. I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe that he's the answer for me. And I, I would say for most of us in the room this morning that we would affirm that, we would say that out loud. Uh, I, I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, you never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. If you're sitting in your office or you're sitting at school and the fire alarm goes off, what is your first thing you're typically going to do? N nothing, right? You're just going to sit there because normally when that goes off, it's nothing. It means nothing. Somebody accidentally pulled the alarm or we're having a drill today that we forgot about and we don't really want to leave the building because we're in the middle of something very important. So normally when that thing first goes off, our, our inclination is to do nothing. Um, but if you smell smoke and you hear that fire alarm going off, you're going to get out. You're going to take action. You're going to do something. We've been talking about what must I do to be saved, the most important question of life. And see, that question is the most important question of life because that question is a matter of life and death. And see, it's a true statement. What must I do to be saved? It's the most important question of life, and that's true even if I try to ignore it, even if I try to say, well, that question's no big deal for my life. It's true whether you believe it or not. And so we've been thinking about that, and we're, we've thought in terms of, okay, here's salvation, and we want to walk around it, and we want to look at it from every angle, and we want to see what the Bible says about it. We want a full picture of what the Bible says about how is a person to be saved, how is a person to come in a, into a right relationship with God, a saved condition. And so today our task is to consider the, the concept of belief or of faith. And one of the things we need to talk about going into this, very often in Scripture, the ideas, the concepts of belief and faith, those two words are often very much interchangeable. If you look at a definition of faith out of the original and the original language, you'll get something like the underlying sense of belief, trust, conviction in the person of God and Christ as the only means of salvation, forgiveness of sin, and guarantee of eternal life. And so in, in most cases, these are interchangeable. The, the verb faith, same idea. Uh, one verse that kind of puts the two together in a way that maybe is, makes sense to us, Hebrews 11 verse 6, but without faith, without belief, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so there you get both of those words, both of those concepts together in the same verse. Now, as we begin, one of the things I would put forward for us is that no one in the religious world, there's not much disagreement, there's not, not much argument about the idea that, hey, if I want to be in a right relationship with God, belief is a part of it. Belief is required. We don't tend to argue about that. And before we even get to Scripture, I think it's pretty easy to illustrate that concept. If belief were unnecessary for salvation... You know, we could get groups of people together and, and send them out into town to round up folks and bring them in here against their will, run them through the baptistry, and if belief's not necessary, they'd be saved. Now, that might be a really entertaining reality show, right? Rounding up people against their will, running them through the baptistry, there'd be some lawsuits, but they wouldn't be saved because they wouldn't believe. So belief is very much a part of it. But again, when we want to talk about Scripture, John chapter 8, these are some of the things Jesus said during His ministry. Verse 21 beginning, Then Jesus said to them, Again, I'm going away, and you'll seek me, and you'll die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, well, will he kill himself before he says, because he says, where, where you go, I cannot come. And, and he said to them, you're from beneath, 
I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. Now, this is to his Jewish audience. You might say it's kind of harsh. They're having trouble wrapping their minds around the idea that this carpenter's son out of Nazareth could be connected to God, could be the son of God. And Jesus is saying, you have a choice. You can believe in me and who I am, or you can die in your sins. John chapter 20. John, in writing about the reason that he wrote his gospel, the reason he recorded the good news, it's often considered the purpose statement for his gospel. And so verse 30 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may, have, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did Jesus heal? Why did Jesus perform miracles such as feeding the 5,000? Why did Jesus raise people from the dead, Lazarus, people like that? Well, obviously it benefited the sick person. It benefited the hungry person. It benefited the dead person who's now alive. But the primary purpose was for all of us who would See that in that day, all of us who would read about it later on so that we could believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, Lord in Christ, Savior of the world. So, understanding that people do not tend to argue about whether belief is necessary, the question really seems to be, and the question that's debated in the religious world is this, is belief alone? sufficient to save. In other words, does belief in Jesus equate to saving faith? That's the question that people get tripped up on. And so for a brief time this morning, I want us to go to several key passages of Scripture. I want us to look at, uh, I want us to go to more of what Jesus said, more of what we find in John's gospel. I want us to go to the book of Acts because Acts, are, when you go to Acts, it's church history, but Acts is case studies. In other words, as people were trying to come to a right relationship with Jesus, what was their story? What did they ask? What were they told to do? What did they do? It's a case study after case study of how people came to be right with God. And so Acts is very valuable. We also want to look at some doctrinal teachings, some from Paul, some from James. We'll do that, and the lesson this morning will be yours. And so again, what did Jesus say during his ministry about belief? A little bit more we want to notice. And again, this is from the book of John, and we read part of this in our group reading this morning, but go to John 3. I'll begin in verse 16, because that's the famous verse, the one that everybody knows. And so Jesus says, "...for God so loved the world." that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Now, know what it doesn't say doesn't say that a person who believes in him will not perish. It doesn't say that. But again, the purpose of Jesus spending time on our planet was to save people. He didn't come here during his ministry to condemn. He wanted people to listen to him, to surrender to God's way, to follow him. He, he didn't then and still doesn't want people today to be lost. And so his message then during his ministry was, hey, I'm here. I'm not here to condemn you, but if you believe in me, you, you, you won't be condemned. But if you don't believe, you're condemned already because you're missing it. That's why we talked about Acts chapter 4, verse 12, where in the book of Acts, Peter makes this statement, there is salvation in no other name other than the name of Jesus. Go with me to John chapter 6. Again, and, and there's a lot said about belief in John chapter 6. If you want to spend some quality time reading, read that chapter. But this is what Jesus says there, verse 28. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Now, 
See, Jesus has got this group of people, they're following him around. And what he's just said to them, is, he's just said, listen, you're following me for all the wrong reasons. You were fed a meal and it, and it was lost on you, the miracle, the power from God that, that provided that meal. You're just interested in your next meal. You're not really interested in the signs and what those signs mean. And so then Jesus tells them, instead of seeking your next physical meal, what you really ought to be seeking is spiritual food. And then he says, the work of God, the work that has been ordained by God, that's been put in place by God, because you need to believe in him whom God sent. And don't let this be lost on us. Jesus has just referred to belief as a work. And that's going to have implications when we talk about baptism because some people will say that baptism can't be required for salvation because if it's required for salvation, it's a work. It's something that you do. And if it's a work and something that you've got to do, then salvation is no longer of grace. Jesus just called belief a work. And I never hear anybody say, well, belief can't be required then because if belief is a work, then it's something that you do. And then that means salvation is no longer of grace. They don't make that argument. And so again, that's going to be important when we talk about baptism. One more from John 6, John 6, verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Now, if these passages in John had to stand on their own, in other words, if we had nothing else in Scripture about belief and about salvation and about what it means to be right with God, you could take these passages and you could attempt to make the case that if you believe, salvation is yours. But again, keep in mind, the Jews are being confronted with, with evidence that this carpenter's son from Nazareth, this guy that they grew up around, this common guy, is not just a carpenter's son from Nazareth. They're having to come to terms with the idea that he's been sent by God, and they're having all kinds of trouble wrapping their minds around that. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for a king. They're looking for someone who can take on Rome. And so believing in him is a huge challenge for them during his ministry. And that's the point, John 6. Jesus is saying, hey, you've got to accept this fundamental truth about who I am if you want to be saved. But see, that's not all that Scripture has to say about belief. Let's go back to Acts chapter 16. Now, we noticed this a couple of weeks ago as we were overviewing the what must I do to be saved question and let's remember and put this in context, Paul and Silas, they're in prison because Paul got frustrated. This demon-possessed girl was following them around, uh, uh, you know, and saying, these, 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 are, these guys, they're giving the word of God. And he, she was after them and he got frustrated. And when he cast the demon out of her, then her owners, her handlers, they had Paul and Silas beaten, arrested, thrown in prison. And so they're thrown into the inner part of the prison, reserved for the most hardened of criminals, no fresh air, no light, fastened in stocks, which is in essence a form of torture. But ultimately, this Philippian jailer is going to be converted. Now, who was this jailer? Uh, we're told it was the practice of Rome to send retired soldiers to populate colonies. So it's speculated this jailer may well have been a veteran of the Roman army. He would have represented the sturdy middle class of Philippi. And so I want to pick up reading in verse 23 of the text, Acts 16. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Well, see, the reason for that, Roman law said, 
If you have charge over a prisoner and you do not do your job, you as the person who failed to do your job, you receive the punishment that prisoners were to receive. So evidently somebody in that prison was under a death sentence. And so the jailer thinks, well, I'm going to die anyway, so I'm going to get this over with. Verse 28, but Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Notice the response. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all of his household. In answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? They did not respond, hey, there's nothing you can do. It's all about what God does. That was not the response. Why did they answer, hey, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that is the answer. He needs to believe in Jesus. But then the very next thing they do is they, they share the word of the Lord with him so that he has a basis for belief. He didn't know. He'd been sleeping when they were singing praises to God. He was asleep. It was the prisoners who heard them singing. So they speak the word. They share the good news, provide a basis for belief. And then the text says, and immediately he and his household, they're baptized. In other words, sharing the word of the Lord Jesus Christ resulted in belief, which then resulted in obedience. Go with me to Romans chapter 10. We were in Romans chapter 10 last week, but I want to go back there again. This is doctrinal teaching from Paul. And remember, doctrine matters. What the Bible says about the way things work matters. Doctrinal teaching from Paul, his idea is, I want Israel to be saved, but they've got to understand that salvation is for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles. It's for everyone who obeys God. That's his point. But in this, he's also going to help us understand something about the way belief works. Notice Romans 10, verse 8, beginning. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Again, the point being, if a Gentile calls on the name of the Lord, if a Gentile hears the word and believes, if they go through this process, they're going to be saved too. That's his point. But he's, he's teaching us something about belief. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then verse 14, how then shall they call on Him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So, Calling on the name of the Lord is not the same as believing in Him because what Paul has just said in the text is that calling on the name of the Lord occurs after believing. I can't call on the name of the Lord until I've believed, and so belief cannot equate to calling on the name of the Lord. Therefore, calling on Him is made possible by belief. And so from the text, we learn very simply that calling on Him and believing in Him cannot and are not the same thing. And the point is made with the jailer. Hearing had to occur so that he could believe, so that he could then obey, call on the name of the Lord, surrender his life in obedience. One more passage, James chapter 2. In James 2, this is, of course, doctrinal teaching from James. James writes this, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works or belief without works is dead? If you have, if having faith or believing equates to saving faith, then the devil himself is saved. 
Do you see that from that verse? And during Jesus' ministry, demon after demon, they knew who Jesus was. It's the whole thing that creates the problem in Acts chapter 16, that the that, that heckling from the demon-possessed girl. She's going around constantly saying, hey, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. The demons knew. They believed who Jesus was. They just didn't want to follow him. So if believing equated to to being right with God, the devil himself would be saved. And so again, if if, if all we had were those words we noticed from Jesus in the book of John regarding belief, you might want to try to conclude that belief alone is sufficient. And please don't get me wrong here. A full study of everything that Jesus taught during his ministry in the Gospels quickly reveals that his teaching was that belief would produce obedience. That's what Jesus taught. Mark 16, 16 illustrates that, and we'll get to that in this series later on. But in the book of Acts, the case studies, they always reveal that belief is what produces Obedience. And further, belief alone doesn't constitute obedience to the gospel, obedience to the good news. Acts chapter 2, last week we were talking about Peter and his sermon, and he delivers this sermon, and they asked, what must we do? Peter didn't say believe. He didn't need to say believe. He'd preached a sermon. They're cut to the heart. He knows they believe. He's got their attention. They are scared at this point. What do we need to do to be right with God? And so his response is... Repent and be baptized. That's your next step. One of the other conversion cases in Acts chapter 8, you've got the Ethiopian eunuch who has been to worship. He's reading Isaiah. He doesn't understand what he's reading. Philip shows up and shares the gospel with him, begins from that scripture, preaches to him Jesus. And so in Acts verse eight, the, uh, chapter 8, verse 37, the eunuch says, Hey, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip says, You may if you believe with all your heart. Belief precedes obedience. Acts 16, the jailer had to be taught so that he could believe so that then obedience could result. And so here's the point for this morning. From both doctrinal study in the Scriptures, from case study in the Scriptures, the Bible teaches that salvation results when belief produces active obedience in the seeker. Doctrine matters. And I understand we may have some folks in the room or online who have been taught a different plan regarding how to be saved. And you may have been taught a different plan regarding how to be saved by people that you have the utmost level of trust for. And nobody likes being told, well, what you've believed for a great portion of your life is wrong. Nobody likes admitting to be wrong. None of us like that about anything. And so your first thought might be, well, this is not what I've heard from people that I trust. And so your first thought might be, I'm just going to reject this. And here's my challenge to you. Take your Bible and read the book of Acts. Read it for yourself. We are in such a better place than so many before us who did not have this all written down. If we will read the Bible, and as I said last week, try to get the preconceived biases and the preconceived teachings out of the way and just read it for what it says. Make yourself a chart. Look at a conversion story and, and read about what does this, what has this been, person been told that they need to do to be right with God? Read Acts. Read those conversion stories. The Bible will teach in a very simple way if we'll simply allow it to. And then when you read, make notes about instructions that maybe you've heard people say, and then look for those in Scripture and and see if you find them there. People in the world, they'll say, well, you, you pray a prayer for salvation. They call it the sinner's prayer. Look for that in the book of Acts. I don't think you're going to find it. People in the world will say, well, you've got to let Jesus into your heart and look for that in the book of Acts, and I don't think you're going to find it. Or somebody's going to say, well, what you've got to do is you've got to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Look for that in the book of Acts. And if you find find any of those, please let me know, because all I want to do is follow this. I want to be right with God based on what He said in Scripture. And so if I've missed something, I need you to let me know. But I don't think you're going to find those things there. 
because I haven't found them in my Bible. Maybe you're here today, and to anyone who asks, you would state that you believe that Jesus died and that He was raised again so that you can be saved. And you truly believe that, but for whatever reason, you've not responded in obedience like the jailer did, like those people did on the day of Pentecost. And so my question would be, is there something that's preventing you from acting on what you believe in today or what you say you believe in today? Again, we began with C.S. Lewis, and it's a really good quote. You never know how much you believe really anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. If you've heard the gospel, and you have, but you haven't responded in obedience, could it be that you don't believe that your positive response is a matter of life and death? Or is there something else maybe you don't believe? Perhaps your current belief is that, well, baptism isn't necessary because I've been taught that it's not necessary by other people. Perhaps you believe that God will, will change His mind and not punish people as He has said that He will. Now, God can do what He wants, but the Bible says that He cannot lie, and the Bible makes some promises through Paul, through Paul's inspired pen. Paul wrote about two groups of people who will be lost. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, he said, people who do not know God will be lost. People who've never heard the good news, that's why we evangelize. People who do not know God, and number two, those who do not obey the gospel, people who have heard the good news but have not acted on what they've been taught. And so in the next verse, he goes on to say, people in these two categories will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. Could it be that it's a false belief about time? You know, I've got more time than I don't need to do that today because time is on my side. Our church has been walking through a valley of loss. If that's not a reminder that you don't know how much time you have, I don't know how it's for us to be reminded. And so all I'm trying to say is that when a person really believes the house is on fire, you don't have to plead with them to get out. They know what to do. The worst kind of danger is the danger that you do not know you're in. Is your belief in Jesus as the Son of God and sacrifice for your sins, is it sufficient to move you to action today? Do you need to obey Him today? Do you need to complete your obedience by being baptized into Christ? And yes, we're going to talk more about that. We're going to talk about repentance next week. We're going to talk about confession. We're going to talk about baptism. Most of us have done that. Today, maybe you're here and your walk with God hasn't been what you need it to be, and maybe you need our shepherds to pray with you and for you. If you have a need today, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing.